Let's open our Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter number 22. Genesis chapter number 22. And uh, we'll share with you from the Word of God for just a little while uh, some thoughts here, some familiar verses of Scripture, very familiar verses of Scripture. And uh, we just pray the Lord to touch our hearts afresh with it. Uh, let me give you an invitation to come be with us this morning at the, uh, here at the Concord Baptist Church. Sunday morning, Sunday school begins at 10. Preaching hour is 11. Sunday night service is at 6. And then Wednesday night, Bible study, prayer meeting, preaching service at 7 o'clock. We'd love to have you to any or all the services here at the Concord Baptist Church. Been preaching on Wednesday night, uh, dealing with worship for a, a few weeks now, and uh, preaching on Sunday mornings uh, for the last few weeks on hearing the voice of God. And I uh, got another message on my heart about the voice of God this morning. And we need to hear from heaven, and we need to worship the Lord. I tell you, there are two things that are uh, needed in our day is a real word from heaven and a real worship of God. Uh, there's a lot of places and circumstances that say they're getting a word from heaven, but if you look at it, it's contrary to this book. There's a lot of people that say they're worshiping God. But if you dig into it, it's contrary to what the Bible says worship is. I tell you what we need is a real word from heaven and some real worship of the Lord. So I, I want us to deal with another thought here out of Genesis 22. If you think about Abraham, uh, the first two mentions really of worship, the ideal of worship and then the act of worship is found in the life of Abraham. We see the ideal of worship is found when those visitors come to Abraham's tent. He spends time at their feet there, uh, at, at their feet there in, under a tree outside of his tent worshiping. And that's, of course, right before the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. You come to Genesis 22 and you'll find the first mention of of the word worship anywhere in your Bible. Now, it's uh, worth pointing out. Of course, we know Genesis 22 is the story of Abraham taking Isaac up on Moriah, and it's a beautiful picture of Calvary. And I tell you, I appreciate the Lord for giving us this beautiful picture of Calvary. And it would be interesting to note that the very first time that the word worship is ever mentioned. It's in connection with a father giving his son. It'd also be worthy of note that the very first time the word love is ever mentioned in the Bible is in connection with the father giving his son. Uh, and so you've preached through Genesis 22, and I've preached through it a thousand times, and uh, saw Calvary out of it. And this beautiful picture of Calvary the Lord has given us so early in the Scriptures. And we've all preached it that way. As a matter of fact, that's the way I've almost entirely preached it. But sometimes I'm afraid that we miss the fact that this is a story of a literal man, a real man, taking his real son up a mountain to slay him. And the emotional turmoil, the anguish of heart that would have been inside the uh, man Abraham. And I want you to think this morning, it was, it was a actual, ha that's the most practical of applications here, is that this is a real man trying to trust God and worship him through his troubles. And that's what I want to look at this morning. Verse 1. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. And said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Get thee in the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering. Upon one of the mountains which I'll tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. 
and Isaac his son. He clave the wood for the burnt offering, rose up, went to the place which God had told him. When he'd left, then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Come again unto you. I and the lad go yonder and worship. We trust that the Lord will add the blessing to the reading of his word. Abraham facing the greatest trial of his life, facing unimaginable anguish, no doubt facing unimaginable anxieties, looked at these other men in verse number 5 and said, I and the lad are going yonder to worship. Abraham was a man that was going to determine in his heart to worship God even in the lowest time of his life, even in the most anguished time of his life. Abraham was a man that was going to learn to worship through his pain. It's strange when we think about it and look in the scriptures how opposite our ideal of worship often is from actual worship in the scriptures. No, we think about our ideal of worship, we think of great jubilation. We think of a time of release, a time of uh, feeling free, a time of happiness. But oftentimes in the scriptures there is a connection between worship and suffering. There's a connection between the act of worship and hardship. And I would submit to you that while it is great on a Sunday morning to stand and praise God with our lips and freedom and joy, that real heartfelt Bible worship is mostly done during times of hardships and troubles and pain. That's opposite as to what the Big time TV boys would tell you, they would tell you that worship is always connected with wearing a Rolex watch and driving a Rolls Royce. But I'm going to tell you that worship is often connected with suffering. Paul said that I may know him and the fellowship of his suffering. A lot of times worship, instead of bringing us on a high, puts us down on our face. I want us to think about worship this morning. I want to be honest with you. I told them at the church Sunday night, I preached this message Sunday night, and I told them then, I said, I'm at a kindergarten level when it comes to this thing of worshiping through pain. Too often, Brother Allen, when trouble comes into my life, I act like a spoiled brat, a sniveling kid. I'm fussing and complaining and griping and growling. Why me? Woe is me. Why has it got to be this way? The last thing on my mind is worshiping God. I'm angry and aggravated. I imagine that a lot of you that are listening to me this morning struggle with this same thing. You struggle with being able to worship when hard times come. You're able to praise God during the good times, and there is a difference between worship and praise. You're able to praise God during the good times, but when the slow times come, when the rugs jerked out from under you, worship's hard to do. And yet, we've all been touched by people who have faced the worst of circumstances and worshiped God through them. Have you ever thought about that? When a bad diagnosis comes from the doctor, our expectation is that people will be angry and aggravated and pitch a fit. When trouble comes in the family, our expectation is that both sides will be mad and angry. Any kind of trouble, we expect people to throw a fit. But on that rare occasion, when trouble comes 
and somebody keeps a sweet spirit and worships through it those times when you can see those folks who are, you know, facing turmoils and troubles and they're faithful to come in the house of God and run their hands up and worship the Lord even under immense pain, even under terrible pressures. That touches the lives of everybody that they touch. Everybody is touched by that kind of resolve and by that kind of worship when someone is able to worship through the pain that they're going through. How did Abraham do it? How did he allow trouble to push him even deeper with the Lord? How did he allow his spirit to remain sweet and his worship to remain real? That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I see just about three things here real quick in the life of Abraham and I want to talk to you about worshiping through your pain worshiping through trouble number one Abraham focused on God's promises not on explanations now I want to explain to you what I'm saying there Abraham didn't ask why you'll never find in the verses here when God tells him to go and offer Isaac, he didn't ask why. Now, I'm not necessarily against asking God why. I think sometimes it's entirely pro appropriate. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus said, My God, my God, why? So even Jesus asked why. But what I am going to say to you this morning is that even if Abraham thought why, and he probably did, he never allowed himself to live in the why. And that's the problem that a lot of us face. It's one thing to ask why when trouble comes in our lives. It's another thing to be consumed with the why. When troubles come, they come. You can ask God and search the Scriptures for an answer as to why, but if you don't readily find it, the best thing to do is to leave that why business alone. Trust God. Believe the Lord in His promises. Focus on the promises of God and not allow yourself to fall deep in the depths of asking why. I'm going to preach this morning a little bit on how to hear the voice of God. And I'll give those of you that are faithful to tune into the radio a little sneak peek. It's all about the word. If you're gonna if you're gonna pray and ask God for an answer in your life and then not read your Bible, you're basically wasting your time because you'll never hear from God outside of His Word. People say, Well, God told me that no, He did not. If it's not in the Bible, God didn't tell them. That's God gave us a word. And so if you want to try and figure out why. You ask God, well, why did this happen? Why did this happen? And then you never read your Bible. You're never going to know why because that's how God communicates. But you may pray and study your Bible and still not know why. And if that's true in your case, it may be that God don't, know, don't want you to know why. And so the thing to do is to not get caught up in that, but just move on. Say, well, for whatever reason, this is it's not meant for me to know why this is happening. It's not meant for me to understand it. I can't live in it. I can't focus on it. I've got to trust the promises of God and move on. Now, what was the promise of God in, Abra in Abraham's life? Well, here was the promise. God had promised Abraham that Isaac would be the seed by which the Savior would come. And that could not happen if Isaac was dead. That was, so Abraham knew and believed that God was going to do one of two things. Either God would not require Abraham to be slain and make another way, or God would raise Abraham from the dead. That's what they, that's, or raise Isaac from the dead. That's what Abraham believed. Hebrews 11, the Bible said, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. 
And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, according that God was a- accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So in the mind of Abraham, Isaac was already dead. He took, a- he took Isaac up on Mount Moriah with his faith solely in the promises of God. He couldn't put his finger on it. He couldn't figure it out. He couldn't make a rationale about it. He didn't know why God was doing it. He just had the Word of God. He had the promises of God. And that's what he focused on instead of allowing himself to focus on the why and the explanation. He focused on the fact that he had a promise from God and he worshiped God through his pain, focused on God's promises. There's a lot of things that happen that I don't know why. I've pastored 25 years, and I don't mean to say that I am by any way uh, advanced in wisdom, but I am reminded, seems like every day, Brother Allen, that I'm not as young as I used to be. (laughs) I was having a conversation with a guy I'd met, and actually run into him on the road at at the end of my driveway, on uh, Friday and he was asking me about where he might find some grouse to hunt and whatnot. He'd been out looking for some grouse and I said, well, there used to be grouse around here when I was a boy. (laughs) He said, well, we ain't boys no more. He said, that's been a long time ago. He said, mean you ain't boys. I said, you're right. He said, I'm 80 years old. (laughs) I thought, good night. How old does he think I am? Surely he don't think I'm 80 years old. But I'm reminded, it seems like as time goes by, that I'm not as young as I used to be. And I guess in that time I have accumulated some amount of wisdom. And if there's one thing that I have learned, it's that there's times you're not going to know why. Even though there's things I don't understand. I wished I had an explanation for why, for people. You know, we've got folks in our church, Brother Allen, that are some of our very best people. I mean, shining examples. And over the last couple of years, they've been through a lot of trials. And, you know, I look at it, and in my mind, I go, I don't understand why them good people have to go through that. Now, let's just be honest. Everybody that's listening to me this morning, you you can act like you're real super spiritual, but all of us have that thought. Why do they have to go through that? Or you have it. Why do I have to go through it? What I'm telling you is that's natural. Everybody thinks it. But you can't become consumed with it. Because if you start becoming consumed with the why things happen, The devil use that in your life and destroy your faith. Focused on the promise of God and not the the explanations. Then, let me give you this. He focused on God's power and not on his own human resources. God had promised a son to Abraham when he was 100 years old. (laughs) 100 years old. That's impossible. It's impossible for a man and a woman that age to have a child. It can't happen. But God in his power had proven himself and given him Isaac. And really what it was, it was a resurrection of sort. Romans 4.18 says, Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, shall so, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So in other words, uh, Abraham's body as far as child, uh, uh, fathering a child was dead. Abraham's womb was dead. But God in his power resurrected those things and brought them forth a son in a miraculous way. And if God's power had worked in the past, 
it'd work again. That's what Abraham was folk. Abraham knew if God was powerful enough to give him Isaac in a miraculous way, he was powerful enough to work this out too. Now, Abraham was one of the most one of the richest men, one of the richest men of his day. He could, have, he could have said, I can't take my son up there and hired a servant to do it. But that ain't what God said. Abraham didn't try to rook and crook and fool God in some way. No. He didn't even argue with God and say, let me send you Ishmael. Did you ever think about it? He didn't say, God, let me send Ishmael. No. He simply did what God told him to and trusted the power of God to take care of it. Sometimes I think we forget just how powerful of a God we serve. Troubles come, problems come, heartaches come, and we'll think, well, God, God can't do this, it's too big for God. And we're kind of like the disciples who sat on the boat in the storm and the baskets from the feeding of the 5,000 were at their feet. And yet they cried, Lord, care us not that we perish because they considered not the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. How many times has God come through in your life? That's how you can worship through it. You may not understand it. It may not seem like there's any way it's ever going to work out. It may seem like a hopeless situation. But down deep in your heart of faith, you can find a belief that somehow God's powerful enough and worship Him through it. Let me give you this third thing and I'm done. He focused on God's purpose, on God's purpose, and not his own personal desires. Did you know God definitely had a purpose for the trial that Abraham was going through? But it's entirely possible that Abraham never understood completely the purpose. I mean, out of it, Abraham got a deeper relationship with God, and he got a clearer vision of who God is. He got an understanding of the gospel. Way back yonder in the book of Genesis, the gospel preached unto Abraham. But I don't think Abraham really ever understood exactly the completeness of the purpose of what he did. You know, I think if you'd have told Abraham, hey, Abraham, thousands of years after this, maybe 5,000 years later, there's going to be churches that will be preaching on what you did. What you've done today is a beautiful picture of what God's going to do in giving his son on Calvary a ransom for, uh, uh, a ransom for the world, and people are going to use it for thousands of years to come to show people the beautiful picture of Calvary. I don't think he understood all of that. I don't think he ever saw all that. He may have never known the purpose, but he knew there was a purpose. So I'm saying, and for that reason, he said, I'm the lad. Go yonder and worship. I'll say this. God does everything he does and allows everything he allows for a purpose. But you may not know it. You may. I mean, there's been times, Brother Allen, that I've went through things, and pretty soon after it, I thought, well, that's why I went through that. And then sometimes years later, I'd think, oh, well, that's the reason I went through that. I understand that now. But then there's times you go through things and you never do know. You never know the why, like I was saying there earlier, and you never know the purpose, what it was that God worked out by that and how he worked things out. Sometimes you don't ever know. But you got to know that there is a purpose. God is working something in your life and through your life that down the road is going to be a blessing either to you or to others. There's a purpose in it. Because of that, Abraham was able to maintain his integrity, his sweet spirit, and say, I and the lad go yonder and worship. Now, let me say this about worship. 
It's not a remedy for suffering. See, we got to be careful about that. Worship is about getting our attitude right when it comes to God. It's divorcing ourselves from this ideal that somehow worship and blessings are tied together. See, that's the way we look at it. We worship because of blessings. We got to understand that worship and blessings are not tied together. Real worship has nothing to do with what God has done, but rather who God is. Uh, the Seraphonician woman, she had a daughter who was vexed with the devil, but she worshiped the Lord before he ever cast that devil out of, out of her daughter. Because she was worshiping him based on who he was not what he had done. You see, as long as we keep blessings and worship tied together, we'll never really worship God for who he is. It'll always be about what he's done. But I want to submit to you this. Regardless of what you're going through today, regardless of what you're facing, the Lord is worthy of your worship simply on the basis of who he is. So worship's not a remedy for suffering. It's not an escape for suffering. It's not a way, even a way that we might endure suffering. It's completely divorced from all that. It's here we are suffering, here we are facing heartache, here we are facing trouble, but God is worthy of our worship regardless of what we're going through. I saw a mother this week, and she was carrying a baby, and I know that the baby is sick, seriously sick, seriously sick. And I went up to her, and I asked about the baby, and she was telling me about some of the uh, specialists that they were going to take it to in different states. And I said to her, I said, boy, the Lord must really have thought a lot about you to have chosen such a special trial for you to go through. And you know, we struggle, we struggle to look at it that way sometimes. But a lot of times the Lord chooses special trials, puts us through them that we might know him better through the fellowship of his suffering. 